Good afternoon. My name is Michael Eaton, and I have the of serving as the Executive Director of the National Model United Nations. Welcome to the closing ceremony of the 2014 NMUN. It has been more than 20 years since I was first a delegate at this conference, representing United Kingdom in the ECOSOC plenary, and I still remember in particular two closing ceremonies that I was part of here at the United Nations. One was in 1999, when Kofi Annan stood here and reminded us that participation in National Model United Nations is an example of global citizenship. This year, with more than 2,700 of your peers from around the world, you are demonstrating that same global citizenship. On behalf of the Board of Directors, I would like to thank you all for your hard work this week, congratulate you as your, on your accomplishments as individuals, and for your work in your local and global communities as citizens of the world. It also gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, His Excellency Jan Eliasson. As I was trying to decide how to make such an introduction, I thought of many of you who are working to build resumes and CVs to apply to graduate school or look for your first jobs after school. So imagine, if you will, a resume that reads something like this. Appointed Deputy Secretary General in 2012 by Ban Ki-moon. The Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General for Darfur and also the Secretary General's personal representative for Iran Iraq. The President of the 60th General Assembly. Sweden's Foreign Minister as well as her Ambassador to the UN and her Ambassador to the United States. The first UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs. He was involved in operations in Africa and the Balkans and took initiatives on landmines, conflict prevention, and humanitarian action, as well as a mediator in the Nagorno Karabakh conflict with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. I spoke once before on how Kofi Annan was one of the two most impressive speeches I have heard here at closing ceremonies at NMUN. The second was this gentleman last year. It is an absolute honor to introduce the Deputy Secretary General, His Excellency Jan Eliasson. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for this uh, gentle reminder of my age. <laughs> I was once uh, introduced uh, uh, at a meeting here in New York. Uh, in my CV, it says, I haven't written myself, but it says that I have a long experience in conflict resolution mediation. And um, I uh, gave speeches in several places about mediation and conflict resolution. But once I came to a group of people that I didn't quite recognize. You know, you, like in this room, I feel the foreign policy vibrations in the room. But at that time, I didn't feel that. It was something strange. Uh, it was uh, men with beards, long beards, and women with dreamy eyes. I didn't mind that at all. But it was a bit strange about the event. And then I looked at the invitation, which was in front of me, at this event. And it says, well, come and meet Jan Eliasson. He is an expert on conflict resolution. And now I realize why I got into the wrong room. Or well, they came in the wrong room. He's a, an expert in conflict resolution and meditation. <laughs> but you have, you've come to the wrong room, the right room, and I am in the right room. Great to see you. And I want to uh, congratulate uh, not only you, you but also congrate, congrate, congratulate us that you have uh, chosen to spend some days on with the uh, UN model work and do that in this place and together with friends and colleagues from all over the world uh, and doing it in the spirit of strengthening international cooperation, strengthening international understanding, strengthen multilateralism. And for this I want to thank you. I can promise you that you will remember uh, these moments uh, you will have friends for life. I've been in several contexts where I know that you create networks. I'm sure that you will have your network from the beginning, but it will be expanded after this event here. 
and that you have chosen the theme of international cooperation in the UN context uh, is something that you will carry with you. And it's not only a question of some blue-eyed idealism. I will tell you that you will be much better prepared for a life in today's globalized world by identifying yourself with another nationality, with another country's foreign policy, with another country's development needs, with another country's search for human rights and respect of the rule of law. This is something that makes you prepared for the world as it is. And uh, this will be a great addition in your life. Those who look inward may find some type of security in looking inward, but they are not going to be prepared for the world that we will have ahead of us. And that world is a world that needs international cooperation, needs you and your work. I would go as far as to say that uh, the time and age in which we live today is actually a test of multilateralism. Uh, multilateralism. Multilateralism and international cooperation is actually at stake. Which road will we choose? We live in a world with lots of uncertainties and a turmoil. We are all in turmoil in different areas of the world, different, areas, different uh, respects. And I think we will, we will be uh, we will be looking for solutions for the international community, which are so complex that we need to work doing them together. We cannot, we cannot find a solution in one area alone. We must get away from the uh, uh, vertical approach, the silo approach. We need to move in the direction of horizontal approach, learning from the different areas uh, that connect each other. The, uh, Vertical approach is very dangerous because you, by that, think that you can solve problems, but the realities in the world are horizontal. So I would suggest that you think and act horizontally. And we have a formula for our work in the United Nations which summarizes this. As Michael was saying, I was president of the General Assembly in 2005 and 6, and I'm very proud of a formula that we, we devised at that time to, to really send the message of horizontal approach, interdependence, and how we need to cross borders in different respects. The formula is the following, and you probably have run into it in your studies or here. There is no peace without development, but there is no development without peace. And there is no lasting peace or sustainable development without respect of human rights and the rule of law. In other words, three pillars on which the work of the United Nations is built but I would go further and say it's not only international cooperation that is built on these three pillars. It is also any well-functioning society. We need to preserve peace. We need to have development with much less of inequalities that we have today. We need to have uh, sustainability. We need to have the rule of law. We need to have respect of human rights. And I would go again as far as to say that if one of these pillars is weak, the whole structure is weak. When I was a student your age, I remember a professor who had a theory where he said, first you have peace in a nation, then you have development, and then you have human rights and rule of law. It's rather primitive, isn't it? We have, of course, to work with all three pursuits at the same time. And this really gives you a tremendous challenge. Of course, I don't ask of you to become uh, or be Renaissance personalities, knowing everything in all these three pillars, but you should, of course, choose some of the specialties that you will choose, and then realize that in order for you to reach results, you need to reach out and work together with others. And I don't limit myself to the United Nations alone. I think that Bretton Woods and San Francisco should be coming together much more intensely than the past, the uh, World Bank, IMF, uh, and uh, the United Nations. I think we should meet, meet much more with the regional organizations. Uh, I always carry the UN Charter in the pocket. I recommend it warmly. There is a chapter in this, uh, in this uh, charter that you may know, cha chapter eight, which calls for regional arrangements. Regional cooperation is part of the UN Charter. Good regional cooperation with the global community is a charter obligation, chapter eight of the UN Charter. These fantastic authors of the charter knew what they were doing, didn't they? Because back in those days, 1945, when this was written, there were only two regional organizations, one in, one in the Arab world and one in Latin America. European Union didn't exist, ASEAN didn't exist, and so forth.
So we need to reach out to the regional organizations, we need to reach out to governments, we need to reach out to parliaments, we need to reach out to the civil society, we need to reach out to the universities, and of course to the private sector. I would suggest that we have a work model where we put the, pr the problem in the center, and a glass of water isn't bad as a problem, by the way. And then ask ourselves, what can we do about this problem? And then do something about it. And this problem, you know, probably taken from the tap, maybe not this time, but it could be taken from the tap in the toilet. This is a luxury. This is a dream for 768 million people in the world. 2.5 billion people don't have sanitation, euphemism for toilets. And 1.1 billion people practice something which is also euphemistically called open defecation. This is the reason why almost 2,000 children die every day in diarrhea, dysentery, dehydration, and cholera. I've seen them die in my own front, my own eyes, and that's why I decided to be very concrete. Not only believe in these principles and purposes of this charter, but always translate that to the meaning of the first three words of this charter, namely, as you all know, we the peoples. If we are to prove our value in the organization, we have to live up to the principles that are laid down here, but we also have to live up to the fact that we are accountable by what, is, what this means for the child, for the woman in need, for the people who are most vulnerable. I was once working for a prime minister in Sweden, my nationality is Swedish, and he said once that there is a good way of measuring the quality of a society. It's simply to look how do we treat our most vulnerable, our poorest, those who are in greatest need. That's the quality control we should make. And we in the United Nations have to realize that this is where we have to deliver, on the ground, to the people. So we have to do all this together. Now, this is the challenge to bring these pursuits in these three areas at the same time. And, uh, let me give you some examples from all three, quickly. First is security. The greatest challenge today in terms of peace and security, in my view, is the present to deal with the present crisis in Ukraine in such a way that we don't see an escalation of the uh, already very dire problem, uh, which is related to basic principles of international law, uh, mainly related to uh, uh, territory, integrity, and sovereignty, but also to the uh, need of Article 33 of the UN Charter, which is my favorite article. It is peaceful settlement of disputes, to uh, live up to the obligation, treaty obligation of the UN to find peaceful settlement of disputes. And what we need to do now, and hope that the, all the players in this very dangerous situation which we find ourselves is to go the road of de-escalation and go the road of political settlement. And of course, to live up to the principles of the UN Charter. And this is where we, have, we will have, of course, great difficulties, but still a huge challenge. And we need to limit this problem to the Ukraine situation and make sure that this doesn't spread uh, like a contagious disease into other areas. We don't want to see a return of the uh, Cold War. I just met some students from Freie Universität, Freie Universität in Berlin, and I got a piece of the wall that tumbled down 1989. And I said when I got that gift, I hope to God we will not have a reawakening Cold War again. And this gift was a very welcome gift. I thank you very much, students from Freie Universität. Security also is, of course, Syria. I want to say to you that Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and I meet every day. We are here at the same time. Very often he travels and I'm here. I have to tend to the shop and uh, vice versa sometimes. Uh, when we meet, almost every day we bring up the uh, Syria situation. It's a deep frustration that we haven't been able to reach peace. I'm sure that you and your model UN work saw the importance of 
and sometimes the damaging importance of the uh, veto right, and therefore we, in the case of Syria, do not have, unfortunately, a strong resolution that could be the basis for work for great diplomats, a great statesman like Kofi Annan, who did the job first, and Lakta Brahim, who does it now. But in the absence of a strong Security Council resolution, uh, their possibilities are limited. What is left to us is very often something else that you probably have worked with very intensely, and that is humanitarian work. We have to deal with an absolutely horrifying situation in Syria and outside Syria. In Syria, unspeakable conditions, uh, at least half a, 250,000 people that we cannot even reach, starvation used as a method, uh, grave difficulties to cross lines and cross borders with humanitarian assistance in spite of existing international humanitarian law. Uh, and then a refugee flow, which is uh, becoming absolutely incredible in size and importance to neighboring countries. You have 2.2 billion people, 2.2 million people in, uh, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Iraq, and uh, Turkey, and half of them are children. A lost generation is being lost. At least half of the children don't go to school or don't get a decent education. And uh, Tony Lake, the head of UNICEF, has pointed to the fact that they are getting stunted. Stunted is a horrible phenomenon of, under, of starving children who start their life and get physically impaired and also mentally damaged because they are stunted. So the statistics, the dying children that I gave on the water and sanitation problems is not it's not really reflecting the fact that we have generations and gener generations of children who never get a chance. So the Syria situation, we hope very much that we will get some type of negotiation started. Uh, we will have stronger requirements on those states who can influence the situation. And then we hope very much that in the enlightened self-interest, the members of the Security Council will come to a common position on Syria because it's so dangerous, not only for the people in Syria and the neighborhood, but it's also extremely dangerous uh, for international peace and security. And there is something dangerous also which goes deeper, and that is that we start to divide humanity into us and them. If, uh, I really want you to think about this fact that in countries and in this world where sometimes governments do not deliver as much as people would like, they lose faith in their nation. They lose faith in the uh, state. So where do they find their loyalty? Well, they look into more primordial aspects. They look to their religion. They look to their ethnic belonging. They look to their tribe. tribe. They look to their sect. They look to their ethnic group. And that is perhaps nothing wrong, because we have to think of roots, uh, where we come from. But if that is done in such a way that you put yourself up here, and the others down here, then you get out of that slippery slope of forgetting every human being's equal value. And I want you as young people to watch out. When you see that tendency of dividing humanity to us and them along those primordial factors, and by that heat up conflicts, bring in an emotional element which makes the conflict so much darker and difficult, more difficult, start to sound the alarm, because we must not depart from the equality of man and equal value of all human beings. On development, if I go to the second pillar, you have this picture in front of you, don't you? Security, we just managed that, now we go to development. Uh, development uh, with the greatest challenge on the development side is first of all to achieve the Millennium Development Goals that we decided, decided in the year 2000. Things are going well in certain sectors, primary education in Africa, Extreme poverty has gone down mainly because of progress in Asia. But we also have grave inequalities. Uh, 85 people, of the, 85, the, the 85 richest people in the world represent uh, almost half of the world population in terms of wealth. It's unbelievable figures, but it has been tested by Oxfam and some professors, and it's correct. That shows the enormous problems of inequalities. Uh, you also have to build up for the future, not only a solid work on poverty eradication based on transformative change, uh, gender equality, job creation, so important for you and your generation, uh, but we also have to think about the aspect of sustainability. I want you to really try to help me and us with something important, namely to take away the false dichotomy, uh, the uh, 
the differenti differentiation between poverty eradication and sustainability. I would claim that we cannot have a realistic poverty eradication program without also bringing in the sustainability dimension. We live in a time of finite resources. We live in a time of huge pressures on nature. We live in a time of climate change, and we better wake up and take a more long-term look. And uh, we may have plan B in life. Do you have plan B on something in your life? Well, I would tell you, even if you have a plan B in life, you don't have a planet B. There is no planet B, and we better realize that as soon as possible. So poverty eradication and sustainability have to come together. Possibly now in this new set of goals that will be decided in the, security, in the General Assembly next fall. And negotiations are going on here among member states, an extremely important negotiation, perhaps the most important in many, many years. And I hope that they will take away again the false line or difference between uh, poverty eradication and sustainability. My last point on development is that I hope also that we understand the importance of institutions. Rule of law, the rights perspective, the qualitative dimension of uh, fighting poverty and standing up for sustainability. We have to have institutions to get, which guarantees continuity and stability in our efforts. If I look back at my own experiences in countries like Afghanistan or Somalia, one of the reasons why it was so hard to get any process going was the lack of institutions. You may look at a country today which is also fighting with getting going in the right direction, namely Libya. You would think that with a population of five million people and oil in the country, you could develop a pretty well-functioning, uh, even prosperous state, but no. After Khomeini left the scene, if I use a euphemism, what happened? No institutions were there. There were no institutions that held up the country. So I would say that we need also to have a structure for that goal, for these goals, 2015 to 30, that guarantees uh, continuity. My own country, by the way, Sweden, uh, are there any Nordics here in the room? Swedes, Norwegians, Danes, Finns? We were among the poorest countries. Thank you. We were among the poorest countries in, uh, in Europe in the 1920s. I'm the first one to get more than seven years of education in my family. My aunt died in tuberculosis, and uh, we were a very poor country back in the 20s and 30s. And then uh, we uh, developed very quickly, and I asked my father, who was a labor union leader, in, and then I asked him, why, why did we develop so quickly? And he said, three things, my son, three things. We built good and strong infrastructure, so we got the wheels turning in industry, and we got a good society working, good roads, good railroads, good hospitals, and so forth. Secondly, we got a good and fair education system, which made it possible for you to graduate the first in your family. And thirdly, good and strong and honest institutions. Those were the, that was the recipe. You can't compare, of course, Sweden to uh, other countries. But I think, yes, you can. But it's hard to sort of say this is the model to take. But I just say that you cannot only set the examples, set the, set the measurements on the poverty eradication scale, you need also to have the quality development of what kind of institutions and what kind of uh, ethics and stand uh, and, and, and structure you have in a society. And the last point is, of course, human rights. Human rights and the rule of law. Again, we the peoples. And the dignity of man. man. I will only mention one thing which I find interesting on the human rights side that is of perhaps special interest to you because it has to do with prevention. I have been mediating in several conflicts, a slightly masochistic pursuit in my life. And if there is anything I've learned is that very often you can, you can, you can see a conflict starting at the stage of human rights violations. If you look over the world and see how conflicts grow and, and, and expand, very often they start with human rights violations. These human rights violations then turn into, in some cases, sadly enough, uh, mass atrocities. Look at Central African Republic or South Sudan right now, many horrible examples of the past. And in the worst of cases, they could go on to the third stage, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, uh, genocide. What is the subject of the responsibility to protect? I'm sure you know. Well. 
My point is this, and the Secretary General has encouraged us to work in this direction. If the first sign of a conflict is human rights violations, why don't we then do more at that stage rather than waiting for the conflict to turn into mass atrocities or ethnic cleansing? And that's our work, to then start to do more at that stage. Go to the Council, give warnings to the Council, uh, send out missions, uh, have si quiet diplomacy, talk to neighboring countries, make sure that you deal with the basic issues uh, and work on the early stage and not wait for the end. And we have come up with a program which is called Rights Up Front, RUF, Rights Up Front, a program that we developed last year and which was launched just now. And if you have interest, are interested in that, turn to my office and we will make sure that you can, can work with this. Because I will give you a great challenge, whatever you can do to really translate the need for prevention to real action is one of the greatest things you can do. If we can get to a situation where the Security Council would act on threats to international peace and security, and not when the conflict is already erupting and the, the house is on fire, then we will save so many lives, we will save so much money, we will save so much of our reputation, we will save so much of night's sleep by acting early. So this is my great challenge to you, translate the need for prevention into real action. It's not easy. Is anyone here aiming for journalism? Possibly a few over there? Well, I challenge you, if you can try to get an article into the paper on the first page where it says the disaster did not occur, I'll give you a prize of some kind. I'll talk to the Nobel Committee in Oslo. But it's so important that we really do prevention early. I was foreign minister of Sweden. I remember the blank eyes of my colleagues when I spoke about something, and the environmental minister spoke about something that needs to be done in the next mandate period. But my God, we have to think about beyond the next mandate period. And those of you who are aiming for the business world, you have to think beyond the quarterly results. So this short-termism that we live in has to be fought, and I think prevention has to be one of our most major pursuits. Okay, I think I could finish here, but I'll just give you a last a little observation. Another challenge is, when we talk about globalization, do we really cover the new global landscape in which we live today? Globalization was very much discussed in the 90s in the terms of free movement of people and ideas, free trade. And I think we still are stuck with that in globalization. I think we should be, go beyond this and ask ourselves, what is new in the new global landscape? And there's some very interesting things that I don't think we have quite yet analyzed. And I challenge you, if you could build up international cooperation in these fields, you are going to contribute to a much better world. I'll just give you the names, the, the, the headings, the headlines. We have a new geopolitical and new geoeconomic landscape. Asia, emerging powers, geopolitical, geoeconomic changes of historic significance the last 25 years. What else is new? Sustainability. My parents didn't even know what the word uh, climate change was. Your parents probably know, but barely. It's a new phenomenon. The fact that we have to have peace with nature, that we have to uh, realize that we have to be more harmony with everything living in this world. New phenomenon. Sustainability is new. Thirdly, what's new? You, you know it better than I. The information and communication revolution. The enormous power in, the, in your fingers. You have so much power in your fingers with those Twitter, with the, everything you have in your hands. I'm medieval, you know, I'm middle-aged. I'm sort of Neanderthal as compared to you. You can mobilize 200,000 people on the streets in, uh, on an issue, and you can make sure that everybody gets the picture of the human rights violations or the, conflict, the result of conflicts. Fantastic power in your hands. Uh, hopefully, you will take care of that well. What else is new? Migration. A quarter of a billion people in the world don't live in the places where they are born. Maybe many of you are probably examples of this in this room. What else is new? Urbanization. 60% of humanity lives in cities. 
It wasn't at all like that. It's been an enormous quick change with strong strain on resources. What else? Organized crime, a new factor in world politics, in, world, in, in the world generally. We need to make sure that we do something about these enormous sums of money who are there illegally. $350 billion in drugs, $150 billion in arms trade, $100 billion in prostitution, 8 to 10 million people sold as slaves in the world. It's a lot of money in that trade, and that is undermining societies. Look at the drugs issue and its effect on societies. And in order not to make you too depressed, there was some very good news in the new world. And I'm not trying to ingratiate myself with almost half of the room here, but this is finally the century for women. It has never happened in history before. This is the day and age when women will be empowered. And it's not... Yeah. It has, it has never happened. In human history, this has never happened. It is happening now, it will happen, and it must happen, and it must be done by all of us. I was serving a prime minister, Olof Palme of Sweden. The speechwriter came in with his speech draft to him, and his title was the importance of, uh, it was corny, the importance of the emancipation of women. And he immediately struck it out and said, you don't understand. It's the importance of the emancipation of man. This is our joint project, and it's going to be liberating all of us. So that's the good news on this rather challenging list of elements in the new global landscape. But look at those elements. I could have gone on for an hour on every subject, so be careful, I won't. But uh, try to look into every one of these sectors and ask yourself, how can we best cooperate around the world? on these issues, not only the UN, but all the actors that I mentioned earlier. And many of you will be active in many other sectors. But I would hope that you live, with, when you go out from these, these premises, and when you are reminding yourself of the values that have brought you here today, then I think you should try to remember that if you continue this road and work productively and creatively to find solutions to some of these issues that I, that I enumerated, both in the present landscape and in the future landscape, you are going to make a difference. And I would say that the international solutions, the international formulas on these issues that we face today, everything from climate to migration, whatever global issue, they cannot be solved nationally. It's by definition impossible climate migration, for instance. So the formula that I want you to take home and hopefully convince your congressmen, your parliamentarians, your editorial writers, your, your civil society friends, is that a good international solution, and I underline good, it has to be good, a good international solution in today's globalized world is a national interest. A good international solution is a national interest. If we can convince the world of this, we take away the false line between national and international, because in today's world, it's the same. And by that, you will have much easier time to sell international cooperation in parliaments to public opinion, to editorial writers. So if we can come to that conclusion, that would be fantastic. And then also my last word of advice to you is that you are equipped with a combination of hard-nosed analysis and belief in basic principles and values. I say to my colleagues in the United Nations, United Nations is a reflection of two realities. We are a reflection, whether we like it or not, of the world as it is, with wars, with injustices, with violations of human rights, with extreme poverty which should not be there. We are a reflection of the world as it is. So our, our job has to start from a hard-nosed, knowledgeable analysis of the world as it is. Don't mix your rosy idealism into that part. But, here I come, I save you. 
The United Nations is also a reflection, a mirror of the world as it should be. We must never forget that starting with the analysis of the world as it is, our job is to also see the world as it should be. And that is stated here, that is stated in your hearts and hopefully your brains at the same time and your stomach. And then our job, and your job, in whatever pursuit you choose, is and should be to diminish the gap between the world as it is and the world as it should be. It might be just a little bit like this. Doesn't matter. And you will have job in every pursuit that you choose to life. But you can contribute in everything you do, from helping a, an immigrant to learn the language or the lessons in school, to uh, going out to the world and do justice and do improve lives. Nobody can do everything. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. And I'm sure that you will contribute in this spirit and hope that you will remember these days at the United Nations. Next time you should be in the glorious hall. This is a temporary room. But uh, seeing you now, looking over this room, I can see the nameplates of every nation here. And I can see that this General Assembly, if we decide to do it together, and come to the conclusion that we can only do it together, then we have a chance to improve the conditions of this world. And we must never give up. I'm often get, getting the question, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And I've always said I'm an optimist, otherwise I would give up, hang up my hat and say goodbye. But I notice now that I'm saying, yes, I am still an optimist, but I worry a lot. I'm an optimist who worries a lot, a worried optimist. The worried is the world as it is, the optimist is the world as it should be. So in this spirit, uh, I want to thank you warmly for inviting me. I hope you have a good trip back. I hope you keep good memories and that you will run with the relay into the next race because we young people have to stick together. Thank you very much. Thank you.